I've reached peak bike, meaning I have more bikes than I have available space, and I have four new ones on the way. And I know some of my regular viewers like to keep up with what bikes I have. And with that in mind, I thought I should go over the current inventory before I start making shifts in the lineup. So here's a spring 2019 bike check, and I'm going to present this from the lowest budget bike to my most expensive, with maybe a few subtle variations. I'll kick things off with my cheapest and least liked bike, the Pacific Evolution. I think I paid $59 for the Evolution and it didn't last long at all and I'd planned on destroying this bike in a video in January but life got in the way. But don't worry, it and its ugly frame will meet its demise soon because I'm in the process of getting permission for what I think will be an epic ending for the Pacific Evolution. $20 more got me a Huffy Cranbrook. I paid $79 for mine, though today I think they're about $90 or $90ish and yes I know I bought the engine kit that I haven't put on it. I'm lazy. And then I got that e-bike and well, I was even less interested in mounting an engine to a Huffy Cranbrook, but don't worry, it's still on the agenda, so you'll eventually see a motor here. Sticking with cruiser bikes for a second and classic styling, at $99, actually I think $118 today, is the Kent Bayside. It's like a Cranbrook, but more friendly on hills. I said $99, but I only paid $30. I found it on clearance. I know a few of you got them on clearance as well, but... This is for a relative, and as soon as I fix a few things, I plan to pass this along to him, so we'll see what happens. Also at $99, once upon a time, there was a bike called the Schwinn Cutback, and it was, in my opinion, somewhat of a new standard for Walmart bikes. Admittedly, the styling isn't for everyone, but the component selection was, and pretty much still is, at $99 a first. I was able to upgrade mine with some spare parts I had laying around and make it even better. You can see the videos I posted on it and I loaned it out and I got it back in different condition. The cutback may have set a new standard, but the Redline Xander, that falls into the too good to be true category. Walmart sold this bike for about six months and it ranged from $279 down to about $152 or $153, which is what I paid, and it had a sized frame and components that rival or even exceed $500 plus dollar bikes at local bike shops. Sadly, it was a one-time run. It was basically a rebadged Diamondback Overdrive ST, which is a $600 bike, and that should tell you how good of a deal this was. This is almost unfair to the Schwinn Aluminum Comp, following up the Xander, but at $198, it's the next on the list, and in my opinion, it's one of the best options for big box budget hardtail mountain bikes. That's as long as you use the word mountain bike loosely, though I did put $55 worth of parts in this, and it turned into a pretty fun bike, and maybe with the replacement of the fork, it could turn into something else. For $1 more at $199 is the bike I view as the best bang per buck currently available at Walmart, and that's the Hyper Hydroform. I've done a lot with the Hydroform thus far. I call it Project Hydro. I have a playlist if you don't know what I'm talking about, and in my opinion, it's a good platform thus far, and soon I'll be completing my vision and hopefully end up with a mountain bike that's capable and budget-friendly. Jumping up a bit to $320 is the Mongoose Malice, though you can buy it for $264 at Academy Sports or go even cheaper and buy the Mongoose Dolomite, which is the same bike. Now, this is my first fat bike, and man is it fun, and I haven't prayed so much for snow in all my life, but I guess that'll never happen. But soon I'll be adding a couple of small upgrades that I think are going to make the Malice even better. The Mongoose XR Pro is the bike that transformed this channel and was my first real project bike and at $379, at least that's what I think I paid for it, it was the king of the big box hill at least until the Hydroform came along and made that sort of a gray area. But thanks to the XR I was able to discover the Uding Air Fork and even the DNM Air Shock, links to both of those in the description, and yes those are 26 inch wheels with lights. But don't look at those. As a matter of fact, don't even look at this bike because it's in a transition stage. And next time you see it, it'll be going up against the Hyper Hydro form, so look at the squiggles. To get to the next bike, I have to go up in the loft in the bike barn. And by the way, there's a whole story as to why I'm not in the bike barn yet, but I'll get to that in an upcoming video. But up in the loft, behind some boxes, there's a sad and dejected Raleigh Tokul one. Or as I call it, Lieutenant Dan, because it has no wheels. But it'll soon get them back, and we'll see what's going to become of the Tokul one. I've actually been seeing those wheels because they're part of Project X, the Hyper Carbon X. I have a playlist for that available as well. And at $399, well, $448 today, this is something different from Walmart, and I saw promise in it. And from my perspective, Project X has been great. It was expensive, yes, but last year it was my most ridden trail bike. It's held up well and even endured a couple of crashes, and I hope that Carbon X is a sign of things to come at Walmart. My Nishiki Colorado Comp, that's another good bike that's been relegated to the sidelines. I almost feel guilty looking at it like this, the poor thing. But don't fret, it's getting its parts back later this month and it's going to need them because there's another contender that's vying for its parking spot. 
There are three bikes that I keep in the living area of my house, and the IKEA slot is one of them, though it's more home decor at this point, because even though the design was award-winning, they chose components that were either discontinued or just outright defective, leading to a recall. What a waste. But the slot it did lead me to better things, like the Priority Classic Plus Gotham Edition. Also very well designed and sporting a belt drive, but this one's reliable and made by Gates. Now, I'm quite fond of all my Priority bikes. The Gotham is my go-to bike for quick errands, and the rack helps. I jumped to the Gotham so I could go belt drive to belt drive, but after the slot, I could have easily came the State Bicycles Montcore 3 because of the pricing. This is my first and only fixed gear bike, and the silver on polished styling really appeals to me, and it's a good bike, but fixed gear is not my thing, so you'll soon see this converted to a single speed where I expect it to shine, quite literally, I mean silver and polish. Moving to the 599 value point is the Aventon Quixote, my almost maybe only gravel bike. It's nicely equipped and fun to ride, at least for a bike with drop bars. And if I didn't have so much money tied up in other projects, I'd love to convert this to 650B wheels and more aggressive gravel tires. Though as is, it's a capable bike and you can't beat the Kev Central orange finish. I said almost maybe my only gravel bike because sitting across from the Tokul up in the loft is a Kent gravel bike that I'll be reviewing soon, so we'll see how that works out. Coming down from the loft, but still in the bike barn, there's another Aventon bike, and this one's still in the box. And on the side of that box, it gives away some details. I can't wait to get this put together, get it out on the road. Because I discovered from the Anchir Power Plus that I really like e-bikes. So much so that I've had to park the Anchir and stay away from it for a few weeks because it's so effortlessly easy that I've started gaining weight. And for those that were worried the Anchir wouldn't hold up, it's still going trouble free and this has been almost five months. And close in price to the Anchir is one of my most liked but least ridden bikes and that's the brilliant L-Train, another Priority Bicycles product. And the L-Train is, to me, all about style. And it looks so good that I only use it for special occasions, and it's also number two of the three bikes that stay in the house with me. My Cannondale Lefty was a $5,000 bike back in 2006, and today it's valued at a little over $700 and worth every penny of it. Now, I'm a huge Lefty fan now, and the Rush 3000 has unseated my Carbon X as the go-to bike for hitting the local trails. From the smooth welds to the quality components, it's a dream to ride, and being a 26er, it's like reliving the good old days. Plus, when trying to match pedals to it, I discovered Fuker pedals. Now to the third bike that stays upstairs with me, the Slada and the L-Train, and that's the Raleigh Redux 3. $900 and well worth every penny, it's basically a mountain bike fitted for the streets. And there's so much to like, the styling, and it was my introduction into one by drivetrains, and the drivetrain on this was more capable than the drivetrains on my mountain bikes of the time. Raleigh was doing so good with their lineup in 2016 and 2017, and then they messed it up. When I bought my Continuum Onyx, I paid $9.99, and this is my most ridden commuter bike. And true to priority billing, it's ultra low maintenance. I mean, I just check air pressure and add air as needed. The new Vinci CVT and the Gates Belt Drive do the rest. If you've never experienced a belt drive paired with CVT, you need to do so. It's rewarding. The Continuum Onyx was the priority king until they released the 600, which is basically a Continuum Onyx jacked up on steroids. It's an all-road bike, being more robust and capable. You can venture outside the non-urban environment, so commute during the day and have fun in the evening. The shining star of the 600 is its pinion 12-speed gearbox with that 600% range. When you pair that with the Gates Belt Drive, it's not a cheap experience, and in my opinion, it's worth every penny for commuters that also want some adventure. Sadly, for the past few months, I haven't been able to ride this because of my shoulder injury, but I'm on the mend, and I look forward to getting back on it soon. And my most expensive bike, that's my Cannondale Trigger 3. The base bike's about 4000 but this Trigger 3's had another 2500 ish dropped into it to create what you see with various upgrades to make it even better. In some cases, there are even upgrades to upgrades. I always get a laugh when I see someone watch one of my videos and make their first comment that says, you don't know what it's like to ride a good bike. Well, there's this. I laugh again when I see people say you have to spend thousands to enjoy a mountain bike trail. I've done it for years on bikes that only cost a few hundred dollars. So is this better than riding a big box bike on the trail? Well, absolutely. And it's a more rewarding and capable experience. But is it my favorite bike? No. My favorite isn't what you would expect. It's not even rideable. It's the last Christmas present I ever received or will ever receive from my mom. People often ask me what bike I would grab if I could only pick one, and this is it. It even has a Merry Christmas license plate that I'll put on every Christmas and think about mom. 
And I say this not to bring anyone down, but to make a point, because it shouldn't matter what your bike is or how much it costs. What matters is the memories that you can build with it. And that's my spring 2019 bike lineup before it starts changing. And now a quick patron shout out. Travis S. Thanks so much for being a patron. And like Travis, you want to make sure you're subscribed and that you have the notification bell active, because there's lots more to come. Thanks to everyone for watching and have a great day.